Aloha. Welcome to this new episode of Pacific Leaders Today, a podcast from the East-West Center dedicated to young leaders from the Pacific. This portion of the series focuses on alumni of the Pacific Island Leadership Program, an East-West Center program that seeks to build leaders dedicated to shaping the future prosperity of the Pacific region by taking informed and effective action and is founded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of China, Taiwan. I'm your host, Philippe, and today I'm having a conversation with Landy Seng Kotaro from Palau. Landy is the current Chief of Staff of the President of Palau. From this unique perspective and her already impressive career, Landy shares with us her vision on the future of the Pacific and the need for leaders from the region to step up, take action, and mostly do what is right for their communities and for the region to build a stronger and more resilient Pacific. Lendi, aloha. Welcome to this podcast. Hi, Philip. Nice to hear your voice again. Um, nice. I'm very honored to be here to be in this podcast interview today. Nice to have you uh, on this. Um, so my first question for you uh, is just of a kind of a background check. Uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about yourself? Where do you come from and what are you currently doing in your life? So, where do I come from? Well, my name is Landi, Landi Sangotaro, but I go, I go by Landi. Um, and I'm from Palau, um, specifically a small state uh, in Palau um, called Esar. And I've done a few things in my life, but currently I am the chief of staff um, to President Whips. So this is the 11th constitutional government of Palau, and I'm deeply blessed and honored to be able to serve as um, chief of staff to this current administration. Um, over the course of the years, I've um, studied um, abroad in the U.S., um, in Asia, in Taiwan, um, and then I've done a couple of fellowships, uh, one being at the East West Center through the Pacific Island Leadership Program. Indeed, and uh, just a quick mention that you also worked at the UN at some point. Yes, I. that was the other fellowship that I did. So I was able to do the fellowship and serve as advisor to the Palau Mission um, to the UN in 2016. Um, mm. So this was uh, shortly after um, our time at the East West Center um, doing the PILP program. Mm. So indeed, you were a particip participant of Generation 2 of the Pacific Island Leadership Program, an East-West Center program funded by the government of Taiwan. Uh, can you tell us uh, why did you decide to participate and, and how did it impact you? And, and you have like now some years to look back because it was in, in 2014. So can you tell us a little bit about this experience? Oh my goodness, that was in 2014. <laughs> Wow. Time flies. Time does fly. It almost feels yeah. like it was just yesterday when we were killing the grass in front of <laughs> <laughs> Hale Manoa trying to play volleyball. Um, I decided to participate uh, in the PIL program um, really because I thought I needed um, another opportunity to, to learn more about the region. Um, as I mentioned, I studied in the U.S. Um, and then in Taiwan. I was able to learn about the wider Asia-Pacific region, but I felt that my knowledge and my network within the Pacific Island region was still very limited. And this presented an opportunity for me to be able to, within the period of only a few weeks, uh, be able to have that in um, experience and engagement. Um, Luckily, my former boss then, I was working at the Congress at the House of Delegates, uh, um, Speaker Sabino Anastasio, still current speaker, by the way, um, really uh, believed in um, widening my experience and allowed me the opportunity to go and participate in this program. This program has actually been very impactful in my life. 
Um, with that, as I mentioned, in 2016, I had an opportunity um, to do, a, it was a Pacific Island um, fellowship program at the UN. And with my experience um, at PILP, I was able to already kind of know how to navigate um, with regional colleagues uh, from the Pacific. There are a couple of Pacific groupings at the UN. And as we say, the Pacific is small. Um, it was always interesting to bring up a name of a colleague and and people would recognize that name. Um, Upon returning home, and even just recently, uh, Philip, um, it was really funny because a couple of months ago, it was an unfortunate incident in which um, a Marshallese national um, died in a fatal car wreck here in Palau. And we were trying to find um, a way to call the president of the RMI for the president of Palau to be able to personally express his condolences um, to President Kabua. And it was a Saturday morning. We were trying to figure out like how to get like his personal phone number because the office phone was ringing. And so happened, I saw Earl online, Earl mm. Carter Bing. And so I messaged him and I was like, hey, are you still working for the president's office? He's like, yes. I need to get a hold of the president. My president wants to talk to your president. And so he was able to give me a number. The first number that he gave me was the president's cell phone number, which obviously did not work. So I asked for another number and he gave me another number. After the first call, um, it rang and then nobody picked up. So President Whips called me back and was like, nobody's picking up this time. Like, just call again. And then Earl messages me and says, the president's cell phone number is not working. So that's his wife's number. And it got through. <laughs> so, I mean, those are some of the very practical things uh, that mm -hmm. really shows like the impact and the usefulness of these types of programs. We can mm -hmm. talk about um, regional issues and advancing those. Um, I'm sure you are aware that COP26 is coming up and mm -hmm. we're somehow going to band together at the, as the Pacific, negotiate on important issues. But there's also things like this, like getting a cell phone number so mm -hmm. we can make a quick phone call. But having that network um, at your disposal is really, really helpful. And I hope I can be of the same value to other people as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, so it's definitely the, the network and the connections that you get in the region that is a, a big impact of the program for you. Yes. Mm. All right. And so uh, in the course of those uh, seven years since you left PILP, uh, as you said, you've accomplished a, a lot of great things and you're now in a, in a very high position in the Palau government. Um, would you describe yourself as a leader today? And, and if so, why? Philip, that's always a hard question. Mm, um, no. <laughs> in our, I believe it's like Pacific Island culture that is shared widely. Certainly it is a Palau culture. Um, it's always difficult to talk about yourself, mm. especially like your own accomplishments. Um, and, and to label yourself as a leader or to label yourself as um, a boss or to label yourself of anything higher than where everyone else is at. Um, but for the purposes of this podcast, it's actually really interesting because right before I made it to get online for this interview, <laughs> I was having discussions with a colleague of mine about how... Um, we can help improve organizational structures, um, may perhaps breaking down some of um, the, the cultures of the workplace that are not necessarily like the most productive um, culture or practices. Um, and it's always difficult uh, uh, trying to affect change, um, trying to do anything different from what everyone is used to. Um, and I think that's leadership. I think it's consistency. I think it's um, being justified in making a change 
um, and doing so with integrity. Um, I That is certainly what I strive to do um, every day in my role. I'd like to believe that this is what I've strived to do, even in other positions that I've held before. But even just as a person, um, I'd like to believe that whether I'm labeled as a leader, um, that my my behavior and um, how I interact with others um, projects these values and these qualities um, that I've 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 honed um, to be the foundation of of daily living, um, really. Um, it's interesting. I, I'm I'm coming back to what you just said on the fact that being a leader is mostly being justified in doing what you do through being authentic, being uh, ethical, and all those uh, important elements. Um, mm-hmm. And you were just talking about COP26, and that's obviously a, a major challenge for our region. Looking at all those challenges that we are facing right now uh, in the region, in what ways do you see leadership and the conversation around leadership as an important element for the future of the Pacific? Um, I think it's really important. I think we're at a critical juncture um, for a lot of Pacific islands, certainly for Palau. The critical juncture is we've developed enough um, to where we can we can be considered perhaps out of least developing countries. But the reality of it is at any given time, any natural disaster would walk back all of that progress within hours, if not less. Um, and that's the reality that we have to understand. That's the, that's the reality that we have to have others understand. Um, at COP26, I think it's most important not only to share like the rhetorics, but to really to really be justified in the sense that we are doing what we can, but we already know that this is not something that can be done individually. Pollution knows no borders. Mm -hmm. Marine pollution, land pollution, um, climate change and global warming, they know no borders. And so if Palau does all it can, it's not going to protect us from being impacted with the adverse impacts of climate change. Mm. So we can save everything we can save and we can stop using plastics. But if everybody else still does it, the impact is still going to be felt by us. But even worse, we don't have a lot of land to be on. We're surrounded by water. We're large ocean states but we are small island developing states as well. And so we really need to be upfront. We need to come together and we really need to tell the world that this cannot, it it also cannot just be one large developed country that commits to making a change for it to work. It has to be everyone from the smallest countries to the biggest countries and we have to do it because it's right Mm. i think that's the most important thing is we can justify it five million different ways but at the heart of it we have to do it because it's right this is our obligation to ourselves this is our obligation to past generations but more importantly it's our obligation to future generations Mm. and and one of the things that um, I especially um, admire and enjoy working with President Whips is we have to do it because it's right. And doing right uh, means you can't go wrong. Mm. And I and think... also, when, when you know it's right, then you just do it. You don't wait for others to tell you to do it or to then you just like start stepping up because you know that's the right thing to do, right? Yes, Yes, and we all have ownership of it. Mm. It's not doing it because somebody told you so, because 
you can always say, well, nobody told me anymore, so I stopped. But if you mm. do it because you know it's right, it's something that can guarantee sustainability. Mm. It's not a one-off. Mm. And so seeing what you see from, from your current position right now and, and seeing how the, the region is uh, organizing itself and how different governments or, or businesses or NGOs, whatever, are currently taking action in the many challenges that we have. How do you see the future of the Pacific in the five to 10 years to come? I think the Pacific has a real golden opportunity to um, regroup, figure out where we're at as a region, and then determine the vision for the next 10, 15 years. I think... um, with any organization um, and with any any formal grouping of any sort, um, you always need time to reflect and time to visualize. Um, we need to be able to reflect on where we came from, where we're at today. Is where we're at today responsive to the current needs of our people? What do we anticipate as needs or challenges that will be faced? How do we prepare for that? And I think that should lead to what the vision of the Pacific should be. Be it climate change, be it ocean conservation, what is it that will help protect our people? And we're not just talking about like protection of territory, but protection of identity, protection of cultures. Mm -hmm. How do we protect our people so that they feel safe in their own lands? They're not taken over. Um, are these some of the challenges that we're facing now? Is it, a, is it, are the threats imminent? Are the risks imminent? Um, and how do those impact society? Visualizing mm-hmm. what kind of society we want for Palau, what kind of society we want for um, other Micronesian islands, other Polynesian, other Melanesian islands, what kind of societies do we envisage 10 to 15 years from today, and then developing, how do we get there? And then going from individual countries to sub-regions and then to the wider Pacific Island region. As a region, where do we want to go and how do we get there? I think that's most important. But stock taking, um, reflecting, and really coming together and declaring that now is the time. It's time for mm. us to step up and do what's right for our people. Indeed. And, and that ties perfectly with my last question for you. Uh, asking questions to people and, and also like helping them reflect, think, and, and try to, to see maybe a, a bigger picture of the challenges of our region. So if you had to give any advice uh any recommendation or just simply if you wanted to share something that is important to you at the moment and that you would like to share with the people listening to this, uh, to this podcast, what would you like to tell them? I would, my biggest worry and my biggest fear is identity loss. Hmm. And identity loss is something that can happen very nuclearly, like as an individual, as as myself, as Landisang, as a Palawan young woman. That identity loss, but also it can be viewed as the loss of identity of the Pacific. And that can come with, that can be um, the result of climate change. That can be the result of low socioeconomic status. That can be the the result of societal dysfunction. Um, That can be the result of losing harmony within an island country. That's my biggest fear. Um, Identity loss, um, is something that I think we need to 
we need to think about a little more and figure out how to how how we can resolve it. Um, I also identify identity loss with culture, with mm-hmm. language, with a people, and movement has become made easier through advanced technology, advanced transportation, um, which is good. It's always good to travel. It's good to learn about the world. But how do we do it and maintain our identity? Um, And it could also be uh, a question for academia. What is identity? Mm -hmm. Um, Is my culture with me wherever I go? Or is culture something that is fluid, that is not stagnant. Um, and if that is the case, uh, or if even if it's not the case, but if we accept that to be true as a society, are we ready to accept everything that comes with it? Um, so if I were to simply share something important, uh, I would say learn to know who you are as a person. It'll pay off later on. Um, this is going to be the foundation of who you are. Um, it's going to be your moral compass. It's going to be, it's going to be the little voice that you hear when everything points you in the wrong direction, your identity, your values, your morals, that's going to be the little voice in your head that will make you do what's right because it's right. Hmm. And keeping identity and culture is also important to give a sense of self and also belonging that kind of roots you in why it's important to fight all those big challenges that kind of tend to take away humanity or or even any idea of whatever is going to happen in the future, right? Yes. Um, Identity gives you purpose. Mm. And when you have purpose, you know what your intentions are you're going to do the right thing. Once you lose purpose, there's a Palawan saying that says, Arragosil. Arragosil. Gosil is an area that um, the current is so strong. And so the seagrass um, at that area go with the, the flow of the current. And so you're not steady in any one place. Um, and I think it's important to know who you are, to be rooted. And that's where you get your your identity and you have purpose and that's mm. that's what will drive us going into the future during these unprecedented times indeed and one thing we can say is that you definitely have a, a clear purpose in your own journey as a leader and uh, and we can definitely trust you to do what is right for your country and for the region in in the times to come so Thank you, Lindy, for uh, all you've done already. Thank you for being with us on this episode. And uh, and good luck for whatever is coming on your way next. Thank you, Philippe. Um, It's been an an honor to be able to share a few thoughts around um, these important issues that the region is facing. And I hope to be able to contribute positively to change uh, if at the very least I inspire one person to go in that direction, <laughs> I think we've we've made progress. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Thank you. Pacific Leaders Today is the podcast produced by the East West Center, a nonprofit organization that promotes better relations and understanding among the people and nations of the United States, Asia, and the Pacific through cooperative study, research, and dialogue. For more information on the center and its leadership programs, go visit eastwestcenter.org. Mahalo, and I'll see you soon for another episode.